looking at a story in Genesis chapter 11, a pretty famous story. It's part of our Bible reading plan, I believe, for tomorrow. So we're going to be focusing on the story of the Tower of Babel, or Babel, if you prefer to pronounce it uh, according to the word that has come from it. Uh, the Tower of Babel or, or Babel. Let's listen now to God's word as we find it in Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower they were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. This ends the reading of God's word, and God always blesses his word to those who listen. A Crack in Creation. That's the title of a recent book uh, written by Jennifer Doudna and Samuel Sternberg. And its subtitle is Gene Editing and the Unthinkable Power to Control Evolution. These are not just sensationalistic writers of the kind that get third-hand ideas and then put them into a book. Jennifer Doudna won the Nobel Prize for her role in the discovery of CRISPR technology, the ability to slice and edit human DNA and other forms of DNA. And so uh, she is a person who knows what she's talking about when it comes to the genetic revolution. She foresees the pos some of the possibilities that are already underway of developing plants that are superfoods that can grow and be more productive than ever before. She imagines the possibility of dealing with mosquitoes. You can genetically modify a mosquito so that it cannot catch malaria or spread it. Millions of people have died of malaria. What if you could engineer mosquitoes so that they can't transmit it? Or if you just say, we are sick and tired of mosquitoes on this planet. You can modify their DNA so that you can make every mosquito born be a male mosquito. You release them into the population and after a while, there aren't any more female mosquitoes being born, and those suckers are gone! Now, who wouldn't want to get rid of mosquitoes? There are some interesting possibilities to explore when it comes to the editing of genes and the things that can be done. You can edit human DNA. And the goal might be to edit human DNA so that the terrible diseases such as Huntington's disease or other diseases that are carried on a gene could be sliced and altered and never transmitted to another generation. You could do some genetic modifications that will help a living person with issues they already have, but a riskier and um, more interesting possibility is what they call germline DNA, in which the changes to the DNA will be transmitted to future generations, not just alter the way your own body works. Do you want to take control of how human DNA goes to the next generations and be the one in charge of that? Do we really know what we're doing?
That's a worthwhile question to ask. And of course, someone as smart as Jennifer Doudna asks a lot of those questions. When we think about the possibilities of, of Babel, it used to be building a big building. Nowadays, some of the possibilities of Babel are a lot smaller, as in the ability to build babies and the ability to mess with the things that make babies what they are. Doudna and Sternberg say advances in gene editing are enabling us to rewrite the very language of life and putting us closer to gaining near complete control of our genetic destiny. We must do so cautiously and with the utmost respect for the unimaginable power it grants us. Unimaginable power. Sounds like um, Emperor Palpatine. In the future, parents may be offered the option of selecting for traits that go beyond disease susceptibility and gender and cross into areas like behavior, physical appearance, or even intelligence. If everybody else is having super babies, are you going to be one of those duds who has ordinary babies? If you could engineer a smarter, faster, better looking baby, wouldn't you want to do that? Edward O. Wilson has been writing in the area of evolutionary biology for years. He's a Harvard professor, and he says, possessing exact knowledge of its genes, collective humanity in a few decades can, if it wishes, select a new direction in evolution and move there quickly. Humanity will be positioned godlike to take control of its own ultimate fate. You might have wondered, why is he talking about genetic engineering when he's just read an old story about an abandoned building project? The motivation is very similar. Positioned, godlike, to take control of our own ultimate fate. Lee Silver wrote a book titled Remaking Eden. It's out of print. These books tend to go out of print. It was written about 20 years ago. And uh, of course, new developments can sometimes change the predictions, but still the ambitions are, are there. He says, today we can control our own evolution. We can decide what genes we give to our children. Already that's being done to a limited extent with embryo selection in fertility clinics. You screen the embryos, you destroy the ones that don't measure up, and then you let the embryos that do measure up go on to be implanted and possibly born. Even with selective abortions, you're choosing not to put certain genes into your child. Like if you wanted a boy and that child was a girl, you abort and try again. The global marketplace will reign supreme. That's the summary. With the power that science is granting us, it will simply be a matter of what people want. Once the power is there, people will want it, and they will use it. That's the thinking of Lee Silver, and he titled his book, Remaking Eden. I think he mistitled it. It should have been titled, Rebuilding Babel. A more popular level book is Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity. And uh, Jamie Matzel in that book um, speaks of test two babies and selecting the kind of babies we want, of, of pre-implantation genetic screening. He thinks that it will be more common in the future not to have babies by the ordinary means, but that test two babies will be more frequently born than babies that didn't involve IVF or that kind of thing, because people will want to screen and, and, and um, alter the kinds of kids they have. And uh, he also imagines um, editing out the genetic diseases, editing in intelligence, good looks, athletic ability, and longevity. I remember not too long ago we focused on the fact that Jesus Christ brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, and some of the attempts to scientifically help us to live 150 years or even 1,000 years. Well, in this book, there is a chapter titled Stealing Immortality from the Gods. Think about that title for a minute. Of course, uh, there is no actual belief in God or the gods, but we are going to get immortality on our own terms if we can figure out how to hack our own genome and fix it. 
So there are a lot of different possibilities in this whole realm of remaking humanity and godlike taking control of our own destiny. Now, some of this isn't really very new in terms of thought. It's new in terms of the ability to get closer to doing it. There is somebody who imagined putting together uh, a human made by a scientist. Uh, that person's name was Mary Shelley, and she wrote a book called Frankenstein. Uh, she imagined what the likely outcome would be if we could reinvent ourselves and create a human. Frankenstein was the name of the scientist. We often call the monster Frankenstein, but that's Frankenstein's monster, and he killed Frankenstein. So uh, there is that risk, of course, when you're messing with um, human genetic material and remaking humanity that you might do a lot of damage to the human race. Well, be that as it may, this advance in technology is originally rooted in God's cultural mandate. God said, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth and fill it, but subdue the earth and rule over it. And humanity, even though it has abandoned God, is really into that subduing part of things and that ruling part of things, but we've forgotten who appointed us to be stewards in the first place and who puts in place some of the limits on what is appropriate in subduing and ruling. If we go back um, to the generations after Adam and after Cain, in Cain's line we find somebody who is very smart and he's got a very creative and smart family. Lamech has given us the first poem in recorded history. And Lamech was not only the person who gave us the first poem, but he gave uh, children who were people of genius. Jabel was the person who was the father of those who live in tents and livestock. In other words, he's the guy who got that way of constructing homes and of dealing with animals underway. The idea that you could tame animals and, and bring them to your own use was something that Jabel did. Jubal was an artist. He gave humanity music, strings and woodwinds. Tubal Cain developed metal, a bronze and iron, and he, that was cutting edge technology, literally. You refined metal and you turn it into cutting things and that changed the way farming is done, the way things are built, the way warfare is conducted, the ability to use different kinds of tools were all part of the brilliance of this family. And as I said, Lamech wrote the first poem in history. What's it about? He said, hey, I killed a man for wounding me. If somebody hurts me, I get 77 times the revenge. That's the first poem in human history that we have recorded, written by a brilliant man with brilliant kids. That's what brilliance will do for you um, if it is not harnessed to God. If the power to subdue and rule is not under the rule of God, then this is what you get. And you also get what... Um, he was, when he wrote this poem, who was he doing it for? For his two wives, Ada and Zilla. He has decided that all forms of marriage are equally good. He's going to do it his way, not the way God originally designed it in the beginning. He's going to have two wives. Why? Because he wants two wives. Isn't that enough? And then he's going to brag to them about the guy he killed. This is our great um, technological genius. So you have... This, uh, this happened before the flood, but even after the flood, the genius was preserved, but so was the sin and the ambition in the human race. And we read from Genesis chapter 11, we'll backtrack a little bit now, and read about somebody in Genesis chapter 10. Nimrod, it's a name that means we will rebel. That's the name Nimrod. We will rebel is my name. Nimrod became a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, and Kalna in Shinar. Does that sound familiar? In chapter 11, we wrote, read about building something on the plain of Shinar called Babel. So he built Babylon in Shinar, and from that land he went to Assyria where he built Nineveh, 
Those were two of the great early empires, by the way. One of those empires, the empire of Babylon, eventually carried away the tribe of Judah, and before that, the empire of Assyria, centered in Nineveh, carried away the ten tribes of Judah. Both of those great cities and empires were originally launched by this man, Nimrod. And so we don't have a lot of details about Nimrod. We just know that he was a mighty warrior and a mighty hunter. And it became a proverb, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. He was, if you want to put it that way, the apex predator. He was a great hunter, and that was considered an important trait in the kings of that time, to be a great hunter. And so you proved your greatness as a monarch by the fact that you could take down lions and other kinds of animals. And so Nimrod is one of these guys who is a man's man. And you don't mess with Nimrod or you die. Whether you're a lion or a human, he is a warrior, he is a hunter, and he will take you out. And this Nimrod is the person who establishes Babel, and then later, after the people are scattered from Babel, he establishes Nineveh, two of the mightiest cities and empires of the ancient world, the empires that uh, eventually um, even exiled God's own people. So you have here again a person with great God-given ability. He's obviously a man of great power, effectiveness, organizational skill, getting people to do what he wants. Um, and, and still today, we have people who have that drive, who have that power. And they might be entrepreneurs and businessmen, but they do things most people don't think of or don't dare to try, and they do them. And so you get these great inventors who become multi-billionaires by coming up with some new technology, and then they got the drive to get people to do what they want. You get some great and charismatic governmental leaders who can wield power and they know how to do that. And all of these are God-given abilities. It takes genius. It takes drive. We have those inventors and researchers who are exploring and exploring and finding stuff that people hardly dared to imagine they'd ever discover and they discover it and they harness it. And so these are all part of the great cultural mandate that God gave before the fall. And the abilities live on in, still in us after the fall into sin and even after the judgment of the flood. Those abilities remain and have continued to develop over time. And to understand how those work, it's helpful to pay some attention to Nimrod and to Babel. And what was going on with Babel? Well, I just want to highlight a number of things. One is a very simple phrase, which you might have just thought was no big deal. Uh, let's make bricks out of mud. That doesn't sound too impressive, does it? Well, early on, if you needed to build something, you needed some natural material there. You'd got rocks and stone, and you built out of stone. The Bible says there wasn't any stone in that area but it was a good agricultural area. And so they said, well, hmm, you know what? We're gonna make bricks out of mud and we're gonna bake them and we don't need stone anymore. We can make it ourselves. We can make our own rocks. And that's what they did. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Humans have been doing that before and ever since. We take stuff that just looks like a blob and turn it into bricks, turn it into buildings. Turn it into magnificent structures. And so it is with all the tools and machines and other things we've invented. We have the ability to remake reality. And that ability comes from God. But we don't always answer to God for it, at least not right away. Another element in building Babel is not just the use of a new technology to develop building materials, but also to centralize power. They want to remain one people with one government. We shall have one world and one world government, and in Nimrod's case, I'm it. So there is a harnessing of human know-how and technology with human centralization of power, and motivating all of that is pride. We want 
to make a name for ourselves. We want to be known. We want to be important. We want to be admired and remembered. And we want monuments to our own greatness. Some of those are still there today. The, the crumbled ziggurats of that area of the world, those crumbled pyramid-like structures are still there. You can go to Egypt and still see the great pyramids standing there thousands of years later. We want to make a name for ourselves, and we might enslave thousands of other people to do that, but we are going to make a name for ourselves. And another element of that is they're going to make earth heavenly. Uh, they always have these dreams of utopia. If I could remake a world, there would be no mosquitoes in it. There would be no genetic defects. All of us would be handsome or beautiful. We'd all be superstar athletes. We'd all be geniuses. If only I was in charge and not somebody else, we could really improve on the way the world is. And so you, you get these ideas, if we would just use our technology and get the right ruler, then paradise would come. And the technology and all of that comes from a religious impulse, and that is to bring God down. Now, I used to think, and I think a lot of others, when you hear the story of the Tower of Babel, is the idea that we would build a tower to heaven to get ourselves up to heaven. But if we understand ancient Near Eastern culture a little better, those towers were actually built for kind of the opposite reason, but for the same effect. Not to bring people up to heaven, but to bring the God down to earth where he can be used for our purposes. Those ziggurats, those towers in Mesopotamia in the ancient Near East were built and they were always built near a temple. And the purpose of that man-made mountain, mountains were a holy place. And once again, if you don't have a mountain, make a mountain! Who cares if you don't have a mountain? Build it yourself. Build it where you want it to be, not where those mountains were originally put. So you build your own mountain in the spot where you need the God to come down. And then he comes down the stairway of that mountain, and he comes in and inhabits the image that you've made for him in the temple that is built right next to that great mountain, that great tower that you put up. And then once he's there, you got him, and he's got you. You do the right rituals, offer the right food, and the God is happy. You're feeding him. And you've got him where you want him. And if you're feeding him, he's going to take care of you. It's fantastic. You bring the God down, and then you get what you want from him. Who could want more from a religion than that? Get him down, get his power and then it's used towards what you want and towards your goals. So you have not so much a stairway to heaven, but a stairway from heaven, and you get God down to where he's going to do you some good. Isn't that what you want from religion? Get God where he's going to do you some good. And, of course, you've got to do him a little bit of good if you want to get some back. That's just how it works, right? Right? So there is no idea that every good and perfect gift comes from one great God, that he doesn't need anything whatsoever from us, that he created all things, that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. All of that idea that's revealed in the Bible is not part of man-made religion. Man-made religion says God needs us and we need the God and we will figure out the technology and the religious practices to get him on our wavelength, to get him to do what we want him to do. Well, God looks down and he says, if as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. It's interesting that in one sense they get what they want. God came down. He came down a long, long way. Uh, they thought they had a real high tower. 
but God has to come down a long way just to get to the top of their tower. And then he comes down and he sees what they're doing and he says, I'm not so sure I like what they're doing. In fact, I'm mighty sure I don't like what they're doing. And he knows what he has done. He has given humanity these God-like powers. And the sky's the limit. There's nothing they can't do. There's nothing they won't do. That's probably the bigger concern. It's not just that they will have unlimited power if they keep this up, but that they will have no moral limit on how they would wield that power. And so God in his mercy says, let's just mess them up a little. We will confuse them. Because originally God had given a command that they should go out to the earth, and instead they're going to stay in one place and centralize, and he wants to scatter them. But he also wants to prevent them. It is an act of God's mercy sometimes to divide us and limit us. When talking about immortality, I mentioned that when people lived to be 900 or 1,000 years, they not only lasted a long time, but they got more and more evil and powerful over the course of such lifetimes. And so God says, I'm not going to put up with that anymore. I'm going to limit human lifespans. And so he made that judgment before the flood and after the flood, human lifespans shortened. He also gave another judgment and he said, not only am I not going to let them live as long, I'm not going to let them centralize completely or cooperate fully or understand each other. I'm not going to let them get on the same wavelength because if they do, there will be no limit to what they try to do. And so he confuses them. And even today, when God confuses, he limits what we can do. And nowadays, of course, we've got AI. We've got the ability to communicate globally. But even now, there's an awful lot of misunderstanding between humans. And in some ways, I wish it weren't so. I wish that people could understand each other and not misunderstand each other so much. But in another sense, God is mercifully putting a limit on how far we can go and on how well we can communicate. And so God, by dividing, is actually doing us a favor by keeping us from becoming as bad as we otherwise might become. Because with completely centralized government and completely unlimited technology and the ability to communicate, what will we do? Where will we go? What, what happened when we split the atom? The nation that prides itself on being the finest on the planet detonated two nuclear devices against its enemy because we needed to. We had to. We were going to save a lot of boys' lives by doing that. But if anybody else were to detonate a weapon like that, we would say they were very, 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 very bad. But when humans get a certain power and they think they can use it and get away with it, they will. That is an established fact of human history. Well, when God divided the people at Babel, um, he did something. He not only scattered them, but Deuteronomy 32 says he disinherited them. When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob has allotted inheritance. So at Babel, God did something. He scattered those nations and he put each of them under the control of various sons of God or supernatural beings. And those supernatural beings themselves were in rebellion against God. And they began, the people were worshiping them as gods and those demonic powers were exerting influence in those nations that they had under their control. Humanity sinned at Babel. God scattered the nations, disowned them, gave them over to other supernatural beings, but not forever. God chose Abraham, and God chose Abraham's offspring to carry on his purpose for creation as stewards, to display his glory, and to eventually bless all nations through the seed of Abraham, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the unfolding of the storyline from the Tower of Babel 
into the rest of history. And so Abraham is called out of the land of Ur. Ur is in, it's called Ur of the Chaldees. You know where the Chaldeans lived? Babylon. That whole area is where Abraham is called out of and told never to go back there again. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. And not just to go to a different plot of land, says the Bible. He was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God, not Nimrod, not Nebuchadnezzar, not Pharaoh, not Sargon. God is the architect and builder of the city that Abraham looked forward to. And all throughout history, there has been a great contest between the city of man and the city of God. If you want to read about that in more detail, get St. Augustine's great book, The City of God. And he contrasts the city of man and the city of God. Well, Babel was scattered. But humans aren't very good at taking no for an answer. And so there are always the ongoing rebuilding projects. And I'll give you just a few examples that the Bible describes. One is the great city of Tyre, which was just off the coast of Canaan. It was kind of an island city, Tyre and Sidon. One person who comes from Tyre, who plays a pretty big role in the Bible, is Jezebel. Anybody recognize that name? She was the daughter of the king of Tyre. And she introduced the worship of Baal into Israel along with her um, foolish and wicked husband Ahab, the worst rulers the ten tribes of Israel ever had. She originated in the city of Tyre. And when we read about Tyre in the Bible and in the book of Ezekiel in particular, God talks about his judgment coming on Tyre. And he's going to judge the king or the ruler of Tyre. And behind that king stands a shadowy figure who is described as having been there in the Garden of Eden. So you have the king of Tyre backed by some sort of fallen angelic demonic power. And Tyre is eventually judged and destroyed. Then you have Babylon rebuilt on Babel. You have the city of Babylon rebuilt under the great king Nebuchadnezzar. And some of you may remember Nebuchadnezzar. He was the one who led the forces that destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple. And it was with him that Daniel and Daniel's three friends sometimes had to deal. But Nebuchadnezzar, you may also remember the story, was walking on the roof of his palace one day. Um, he was the guy who not only had the great armies, but had built the hanging gardens of Babylon and all kinds of magnificent structures. And he said to himself, is not this the great Babylon I have built for my majesty and the glory of my kingdom? And at that very moment, a voice from heaven said, you aren't king anymore. You think you're a cow. Moo! And out he goes. His fingernails are growing. He's trying to eat grass. And he gets kicked out of the palace and out of the kingdom. And after several years of living like a crazy animal, he says that he looked to heaven and his sanity, his mind came back. And then he was restored again to the throne of his kingdom. He found out that the Babylon project for my glory and my majesty doesn't work out so well. He had a descendant named Belshazzar who didn't learn from Nebuchadnezzar's errors. And Belshazzar was holding a big feast using temple instruments that came from the temple of God, drinking from the very cups that had been used in the worship of God in a party, a drunken party with his guests. And a hand started writing on a wall. And he didn't know what it said, so he called for Daniel, who was still alive years later, and Daniel said, well, here's what it says. Mini, mini, tiku, parsin. You have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. You are a lightweight. You don't measure up. Your kingdom is going down tonight. And Belshazzar and Babylon fell. They thought that the mighty walls of Babylon would keep out any enemy. 
But the enemy put a dam in the river that flowed under the walls of Babylon, and they came in right under the walls and took the city and destroyed it. And that was the end of Babylon. It was never rebuilt again. Persia had mighty rulers who gained control over a big empire. At one point, Daniel describes not only the king of Persia, but a heavenly or at least supernatural prince of Persia who's lurking behind the real power of Persia. And then he speaks, after that prince of Persia, he says, is going to come the prince of Greece. Behind that great, swift conquest of Alexander the Great was some supernatural prince of Greece. It was not simply Alexander's genius and human power, although that was a big part of it, but there was supernatural power behind those conquests. And just at the end of his limit of his conquests, Alexander was still of a young man. He died, and his kingdom was divided. Does that sound familiar? Uh, he died at the apex of his power, and his kingdom was divided four ways, and those guys were all always bickering with each other. But one of those four kingdoms eventually was controlled by a guy named Antiochus. And Antiochus was predicted um, centuries earlier by Daniel's writings. And Antiochus was a guy, he took on the word epiphanies, God made manifest. And he sacrificed pigs in the temple of God that had been rebuilt in Jerusalem. He murdered anybody who had copies of the scriptures. He tried to wipe out the people, the Hebrew people who followed the Lord, and then, as Daniel had predicted would happen, he just died, and that was the end of him. But you have again and again and again these rebuilders of Babylon, of the city of man, and unfortunately, whenever you think you're doing humanism, you know what you're really doing? You're never serving just humanity. If it is not the power of God and the wisdom of God directing you, then it will be the power of the demons. It will be the prince of Persia. It will be the prince of Greece. It will be that, that shadowy figure lurking behind the throne of Tyre. It will be Lucifer lurking behind the throne of Babylon, as Isaiah puts it. So, it's very hard to be a good humanist. <laughs> it is very hard because humans are never just left to themselves. There are always, there are, we have enough bad sins and ambitions of our own, but there are powers that we don't even know what we're messing with. And I'm not just talking about the power of DNA and the power of technology. And then, of course, the Bible speaks eventually in terms of a final Babylon. Um, and behind that Babylon stands a great red dragon, a picture of Satan, and of a Nimrod or Nebuchadnezzar or Caesar-like figure uniting all nations against the city of God. Babylon never learns. And Babylon is always there. And the, the reason the Bible tells us this original story of the Tower of Babel or Babel and of the other Babylons that come along and of the final Babylon that is headed our way is so that we at least don't have to live in ignorance. This stuff is ongoing throughout history. There is always that Babylon impulse and we need to be aware of it. The Bible also tells us of a great reversal of Babylon, of a unifying of people but on a different basis than human ambition. On the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples of Jesus. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Each one heard their own language being spoken. And so there is this reversal of the confusion of the languages so that people can understand again. And it comes from God. And it comes from the Holy Spirit. And it is the praise of God and the good news of the gospel and of the Lord who created heaven and earth who calls us back to himself in Christ. That is the reversal of Babel and the reversal of that division of the peoples and the languages. But it is on the basis of God's work and of God's spirit and power, not the prince of Persia or Greece or Babylon, but the prince of peace and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so humans are always going to be seeking unity, but on what basis? Humans are always going to be seeking dominion and power, but from whom? 
and according to whose standards. We want the reversal of Babel just as much as the rebuilders of Babel do. But we are glad that God has reversed Babel in the coming of the Holy Spirit and in the uniting of people, not on any human basis, but on the basis of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to be aware then, in the light of all the light that comes from the Bible and from history, of what's going on in our own time. Technology, this urge to remake reality, it's both good and evil. It's good in the sense that God gave us that cultural mandate and that ability to subdue and to rule. But when united with our sinful nature, it becomes a very destructive tendency. And we don't learn from the stories. We don't learn from the story of Frankenstein. We don't learn from the story of the sorcerer's apprentice. Some of you heard that story? Where the apprentice wants the power of the sorcerer, and when the sorcerer leaves for the day, um, the apprentice uses that power, and things get into a really, really, really big mess because he doesn't know how to wield it. That's what happens when humanity breaks the bonds that God has set in our attempts to remake reality. Or to centralize power. Do I really have to remind you that it's only been four years ago? It's only been four years ago when some of our bright people took a lot of government funding and messed around with enhancing the abilities of viruses. And then, of course, they said that humans had nothing to do with that. That, that just kind of happened. It happened to happen one mile away from a research lab that was engaged in such things. But that, don't believe your own lion eyes. It, it had nothing to do with what was going on in that lab. It, it just took off a mile away from that lab. And, of course, then we saw the powers of centralized government um, to solve the crisis that they had created in the first place. And we've seen well, that's just a little taste. Every so often, we get a taste in history of what happens when humans are too big for their britches and break bonds that they should not mess with. We would be better cautious, and of course we should pray for those who are the rulers, for those who are the scientists and researchers and inventors. But we need to realize that always there's going to be that drive in humanity of pride to make a name for ourselves, to be important, to rule others. C.S. Lewis said, whenever you hear somebody say, mankind has to take charge of his own destiny, here's what it really means. A few men taking charge of all the others. Now, he wrote that quite a while ago, but it's as true, just, we are taking charge of our own evolution. Who is this we you speak of? Okay. It, it sure ain't all of us. There are always going to be a few, a Nimrod, a genetic engineer, a governmental power who is going to be running everybody else. And so we need to realize the dangers of that. Today, one of the interesting areas of research is, of course, artificial intelligence. And there again, our poets are sometimes a little bit ahead of our scientists. Um, go watch The Terminator. That might do you more good than reading a bunch of books about um, artificial intelligence because it tells you what might happen if we, take, if we pool all the knowledge and information we can possibly get from humanity, store it in supercomputers, and then turn it loose. Well, not sure you like how that story ends. But, and of course, science fiction is not Bible truth, but these possibilities that we get from Frankenstein or the Terminator, sometimes the poets see farther than the scientists do. And there is another thing to consider. I've been talking a lot about genetic engineering or artificial intelligence and the dangers of that. Here's one that we don't always pay as much attention to. What if the biggest danger were not the genes that are controlled for the future, but the ideas that govern the next generation? What if education and entertainment and social psychology were more dangerous than artificial intelligence. 
What if the ideas that you're implanting in people's minds, and even more importantly, the truths you're keeping out of their minds, were the biggest danger that we were passing to the next generation, or failing to pass to the next generation? Because you see, it's not ultimately the fact that we have the ability to do great technology or that we need government to organize things. The biggest danger is always we were going to get God on our terms and if we can't, we're going to dispense with God. That was the biggest danger all along. And so the anti-God ideas of Babel, the, the idea that we're going to make heaven on earth, look at the attempts. The French Revolution was going to start, restart history from day one and have, finally, a nation run the way it's supposed to be run. It ended with the guillotine and the dictatorship of Napoleon Bonaparte. In the 20th century, the Russian Revolution was going to give us a worker's paradise. The revolution in China, led by Mao Zedong, was going to create a beautiful paradise for people. Pol Pot was going to get rid of all the intellectuals in Cambodia, and then create a new paradise. Of course, all they got was uh, more than a million people killed in a nation of only four million, and no paradise at all. That's what you get when you get a few humans who know how to make paradise on earth and bring divine power into their own hands. So it's really, of course, uh, something we need to be aware of as Christians that there are these expanding technologies, and they're worth noting. Some of you are involved in um, computer science and artificial intelligence. Others may be involved in medical research, and these are not necessarily bad things. They may be part of the cultural mandate, but if we let them get beyond God's ordained limits, we've got some major problems. The kinds of things that are already being done with in vitro fertilization and the discarding of embryos and the decision of which baby lives and which baby dies, hey, in this Sanctity of Life month, we ought to be, deep, be very aware of what's already happening, not just what might happen somewhere in the future. And we need to give thanks that there is a power that restrains, that divides, that never lets humanity get as bad as it could become, that never lets some ruler become as powerful as he might become, at least not until the very end. The Bible says there is something restraining the man of lawlessness, that final man of sin. There will come a time when what restrains him is taken away, and then Babylon will have its final shot. And then, the Bible says, when Christ comes again, he will deal with that too. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Come out of her, my people. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. If you wondered how the story ends, you really do not want to become involved in the Babylon project. It's headed for the flames. Babylon trades even in the bodies and souls of men, says Revelation. Everything is for sale. The global marketplace will decide, as one of the authors says. Yeah, in Babylon, the global marketplace decides. And then God has his say, and fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, and I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I make everything new. Remember that when you want to reinvent humanity. Humanity has been reinvented. There is already a second Adam. We don't need to invent him or come up with him. God gave us the second Adam in Jesus Christ. He gave that man, Jesus Christ, who's also the Son of God, the perfect immortal body, the perfect genius, and if we learn to walk with him and follow him, then we shall live not in old Babylon, but in the new Jerusalem, the city of God with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. O Lord, open our eyes to the two cities 
that are always at work in this world until the end comes. May we, Lord, look to the Jerusalem, which is our mother, to that great city of God that is going to come down and make all things new in the power of Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to be alert and wary to the attempts right now of, of Babylon to reemerge. We pray, Lord, that you will give us courage, you'll get, <coughs> give us discernment, that you'll keep us from fear and paranoia, but help us to be vigilant and help us, Lord, to use the powers you've granted humanity for your glory and for the good of others and not, Lord, for our own pride or for the manipulation and control of others. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to live in the light of your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> May we use, Lord, that great mission and power of the Spirit to spread the word to people of every nation, tribe, people, and language. We know, Lord, that you judged at Babel, but you also um, gave your mercy at Calvary and at Pentecost. And so we pray that even today the nations will experience the power of the truth, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.